In this video, we're going to study Book 3 of Homer's Iliad. Just as a reminder, uh, we're studying the translation of Homer's Iliad by the English poet Alexander Pope, and the poem was written in iambic pentameter, which I'll try to emphasize as we read it together. As we get further into the book, I'll try to make fewer comments, uh, really only make comments when they're necessary, so we can move a little more quickly through our reading. This is Homer's Iliad, Book 3. <clears throat> Thus, by their leader's care, each martial band moves into ranks and stretches o'er the land. With shouts, the Trojans, rushing from afar, proclaim their motions and provoke the war. So when inclement winters vex the plain with piercing frosts or thick descending rain, to warmer seas the cranes embodied fly with noise and order through the midway sky. To pygmy nations or African nations, wounds and death they bring, and all the war descends upon the wing. But silent, breathing, rage, resolved and skilled, by mutual aids to fix a doubtful field, Swift march the Greeks, the rapid dust around, darkening arises from the labored ground. Thus from his flaggy wings, when Notus sheds a night of vapors round the mountain heads. To thieves more grateful than the midnight shade, while scarce the swains their feeding flocks survey. Lost and confused amidst the thickened day, so wrapped in gathering dust, the Grecian train, a moving cloud, swept on and hid the plain. Now, front to front, the hostile armies stand, eager of fight, and only wait command. When to the van, or front, before the sons of fame, whom Troy sent forth, the beauteous Paris came. Remember Paris? is the prince of Troy, the son of Priam, and he is the man who famously stole Helen from her husband Menelaus. This Paris is the cause of this war, and he rides or moves to the front of the Trojan host. In form or in appearance a god, the panther's speckled hide flowed o'er his armor with an easy pride. His bended bow across his shoulders flung, his sword beside him negligently hung. Two pointed sheer spears he shook with gallant grace and dared the bravest of the Grecian race. Now you can imagine, this is the man whose audacious behavior created this whole struggle and conflict. And here he is parading himself in front of the Trojan army in view of the Greek army. And that's why that passage closes with, and dared the bravest of the Grecian race. 
as thus with glorious hair, glorious air, I'm sorry, and proud disdain, he boldly stalked the foremost on the plain. Him Menelaus loved of Mars espies. So Menelaus, the king of Sparta, whose wife Helen was stolen, he sees Paris out in front of the army. And notice it says that Menelaus is loved of Mars. Mars is the god of battle, the god of war. Menelaus is one of his favorites. Him Menelaus loved of Mars espied with heart elated and with joyful eyes. So joys a lion if the branching deer or mountain goat his bulky prize appear. Eager he seizes and devours the slain, pressed by bold youths and baying dogs in vain. Thus, fond of vengeance, with a furious bound or leap, in clanging arms he leaps upon the ground. From his high chariot, him approaching near, the beauteous champion views with marks of fear. Smit with a conscious sense, retires behind and shuns the fate he well deserved to find. So Paris, or Menelaus seeing Paris, is filled with excitement because he wants his chance to exact vengeance for the wrong that Paris did to him publicly and humiliated him as a king. And so when he sees Paris, he's excited like a lion that sees its prey. And he jumps down from his horse or his chariot and moves to the front of the Greek army. And when Paris sees him, Paris knows he's in trouble. And it says that he retires and shrinks back to the back of the Trojan lines. As when some shepherd from the rustling trees shot forth to view a scaly serpent sees, trembling and pale, he starts with wild affright and all confused precipitates his flight. So from the king the shining warrior flies, and plunged amidst the thickest Trojans lies. As godlike Hector, the greatest of the Trojan warriors, as godlike Hector sees the prince retreat, he thus upbraids him with a generous heat. Unhappy Paris, but to women brave, so fairly formed, and only to deceive. Oh, hadst thou died when thou first saw the light, or died at least before thy nuptial rite? A better fate than vainly thus to boast and fly the scandal of the Trojan host. Gods, how the scornful Greeks exult to see their fears of danger undeceived in thee. Thy figure promised with a martial air, but ill thy soul supplies a form so fair. In former days, in all thy gallant pride, when thy tall ships triumphant stemmed the tide, when Greece beheld thy painted canvas flow, and crowds stood wondering <clears throat> at the 
passing show. Say, was it thus, with such a baffled mien, you met the approaches of the Spartan queen? Thus from her realm conveyed the beauteous prize, and both her warlike lords outshined in Helen's eyes? This deed, thy foe's delight, thy own disgrace, thy father's grief and ruin of thy race. This deed recalls thee to the proffered fight, or hast thou injured whom thou darest not right? Soon to thy cost the field would make thee know. Thou keepest the consort of a braver foe. Thy graceful form, instilling soft desire, thy curling tresses, and thy silver lyre, or musical instrument. Beauty and youth, in vain to these you trust, when youth and beauty shall be laid in dust. Troy yet may wake, and one avenging blow, Crush the dire author of his country's woe. So spoke Hector to Paris. His silence here with blushes Paris breaks. Tis just, my brother, what your anger speaks. But who like thee can boast a soul sedate, so firmly proof to all the shocks of fate? Thy force, like steel, a tempered hardness shows, still edged to wound, and still untired with blows. Like steel, uplifted, by some strenuous swain, with falling woods to strew the wasted plain. Thy gifts I praise, nor thou despise the charms with which a lover golden Venus arms. Soft moving speech and pleasing outward show, no wish can gain them, but the gods bestow. Yet wouldst thou have the proffered combat stand, the Greeks and Trojans seat on either hand, then let a midway space our hosts divide, and on that stage of war the cause be tried. By Paris, there the Spartan king be fought, for beauteous Helen and the wealth she brought, and who his rival can in arms subdue, his be the fair, and his the treasure too. Thus with a lasting league your toils may cease, and Troy possess her fertile fields in peace. Thus may the Greeks review their native shore, much famed for generous steeds, for beauty more. And here Paris, hearing Hector's rebuke, accepts the challenge and agrees to fight Menelaus in hopes of sparing the destruction of Troy. He said, the challenge Hector heard with joy then with his spear restrained the youth of Troy, held by the midst athwart and near the foe, advance with steps majestically slow, while round his dauntless head the Grecians pour, their stones and arrows in a mingled shower. Then thus the monarch Great Atreides, 
pride. Forbear, ye warriors, lay the darts aside. A parley, Hector asks, a message bears. We know him by the various plume or feather upon his helmet he wears. <clears throat> Awed by his high command, the Greeks attend. The tumult silence and the fight suspend. While from the center Hector rolls his eyes on either host, and thus to both applies. Hear all ye Trojan, all ye Grecian bands, what Paris, author of this war, demands. Your shining swords within the sheath restrain, and pitch your lances in the yielding plain. Put your swords away and stick your lances or javelins in the ground. There's going to be no fighting, Hector says. Here in the midst, in either army's sight, he, Paris, dares the Spartan king, Menelaus, to single fight, and wills that Helen and the ravished spoil that caused this contest shall reward the toil. Let these the brave triumphant victor grace, and different nations part in leagues or agreements of peace. And he spoke, in still suspense on either side, each army stood, the Spartan chief replied, Me too, ye warriors here, whose fatal right a world engages in the toils of fight. To me, the labor of the field resign. Me, Paris injured, all the war be mine. Fall he that must beneath his rival's arms and live the rest, secure of future harms. Two lambs, devoted by your country's right to earth a sable and to the sun a white. Prepare, ye Trojans, while a third we bring, select to Jove the inviolable king. Let reverend Priam in the truce engage and add the sanction of considerate age. His sons are faithless, headlong in debate, and youth itself an empty, wavering state. Cool age advances, venerably wise, turns on all hands its deep, discerning eyes, sees what befell and what may yet befall, concludes from both and best provides for all. Notice how Homer, who, remember, is composing this entire poem, teaches wisdom through his poem. Here Menelaus calls for Priam to speak on this agreement that they're making, that Menelaus and Paris would fight. Menelaus accepts the agreement and calls for Priam, the king of Troy, to speak because he's old and he'll speak wisely. The poem continues, The nations here with rising hopes possessed and peaceful prospects dawn or rise in every breast. Within the lines they drew their steeds around their horses and from their chariots issued on the ground. Next, all unbuckling the rich mail they wore, the armor, taking off their armor, laid their bright arms along the sable shore. On either side, 
the meeting hosts, the armies, are seen with lances fixed and close, or close the space between. Two heralds now, or messengers, dispatched to Troy invite the Phrygian monarch to the peaceful right. Two messengers are sent to go and call Priam to the site of the battle where his son Paris is going to fight single-handed uh, combat against Menelaus. Talthebius hastens to the fleet to bring the lamb for Jove, the inviolable king. Meantime, to beauteous Helen, from the skies, the various goddess of the rainbow flies. That's Iris, the goddess of the rainbow, goes and visits Helen. Like fair Laodice in form and face, the loveliest nymph of Priam's royal race. Her in the palace at her loom she found, the golden web her own sad story crowned. The Trojan wars she weaved, herself the prize, and the dire triumphs of her fatal eyes, to whom the goddess of the painted bow, the rainbow, says, Approach and view the wondrous scene below. Each hardy Greek and valiant Trojan knight so dreadful late and furious for the fight, now rest their spears, or lean upon their shields. Ceased is the war, and silent all the fields. Paris alone and Sparta's king advance, in single fight to toss the beamy lance. Each met in arms, the fate of combat tries, thy love the motive, and thy charms the prize. So Iris goes and fetches Helen and tells her that she better come to the window and take a look at what's going on, because the two men that she has had affairs with her husband Menelaus and now Paris are about to go to battle one-on-one uh, -on -one with each other. This said, the many-colored maid inspires. The many-colored maid is Iris, the goddess of the rainbow. This said, the many-colored maid inspires her husband's love and wakes her former fires. Her country parents, all that once were dear, rush to her thought and force a tender tear. O'er her face, o'er her fair face, a snowy veil she threw, and softly sighing from the loom withdrew. Her handmaids, Clymene and Ethra, wait her silent footsteps to the Skyan gate. And there sat the seniors, or the elders, of the Trojan race, old Priam's chiefs, and most in Priam's grace, the king, the first, Thymoetes at his side, Lampus and Cletius long in council tried, Panthus and Hicataeon, once the strong, and next the wisest of the reverend throng. Antenor, grave, and sage Ucalegon, leaned on the walls and basked before the sun. Chiefs, who no more in bloody fights engage, but wise through time, and narrative with age. 
in summer days like grasshoppers rejoice, a bloodless race that sends a feeble voice. These, when the Spartan queen approached the tower, in secret owned resistless beauty's power. They cried, no wonder such celestial charms for nine long years have set the world in arms. What winning graces, what majestic mien. She moves a goddess, and she looks a queen. Yet hence, O oh heaven, convey that fatal face, and from destruction save our Trojan race. So Helen moves from her chamber, as it were, where she was working at her loom. And as she moves out, the old men who sit as Priam's counselors see her. And they basically say, she's so beautiful. There's no wonder that all of this trouble is being produced by her. And yet, as beautiful as she is, we pray that that fatal face would be taken away and from destruction save the Trojan race. The poem goes on. The good old Priam welcomed her and cried, Approach, my child, and grace thy father's side. See on the plain thy Grecian spouse appears, Menelaus, the friends and kindred of thy former years. No crime of thine our present suffering draws not thou, but heaven's disposing will the cause. In other words, Helen, it's not your fault. The gods are responsible, so says Priam. The gods, these armies and this force employ. These are the words of Priam. The hostile gods conspire the fate of Troy. But lift thy eyes and say, what Greek is he? Far as from hence these aged orbs can see. Around whose brow such martial graces shine, so tall, so awful, and almost divine. Though some of larger statue tread the green, none match his grandeur and exalted mien. He seems a monarch, and his country's pride. Thus ceased the king, and thus the fair replied. So, looking down at the armies, Paris notices one particular man who stands out as a very impressive warrior, and he asks Helen, who he assumes knows who these Greek soldiers are, who that man is. Thus ceased the king, and thus the fair, the beautiful Helen, replied. So this is Helen speaking. Before thy presence, father, I appear with conscious shame and reverential fear. Ah, had I died, ere to these walk I fled, false to my country and my nuptial bed. My brothers, friends, and daughter left behind, false to them all, to Paris only kind. And for this I mourn, till grief or dire disease shall waste the form whose fault it was to please. The king of kings, Atrides, you survey, great in the war and great in arts of sway. My brother once, before my days of shame, and oh, that still he bore a brother's name. So the man who had impressed Priam, who he inquired about, was Agamemnon. 
<clears throat> with wonder, Priam viewed that godlike man, <clears throat> extolled the happy prince, and thus began, O oh, blessed Atreides, born to prosperous fate, successful monarch of a mighty state, how vast thy empire, of your matchless train, what numbers lost, what numbers yet remain? In Phrygia once were gallant, were gallant armies known in ancient time, when Atreus filled the throne, when godlike Migdon led their troops of horse and I to join them, raised a Trojan force. Against the man-like Amazons we stood. The Amazons were a race of women warriors, female warriors. That's why he says, against the man-like Amazons we stood. And Sangar's stream ran purple with their blood. But far inferior those in martial grace and strength of numbers to this Grecian race. This said, once more he viewed the warrior train. What's he whose arms lie scattered on the plain? Broad is his breast, his shoulders larger spread, though great Atreides overtops his head. Nor yet appear his care and conduct small, from rank to rank he moves and orders all. The stately ram thus measures o'er the ground, and master of the flock surveys them round. So Priam sees another impressive man and asks Helen again, who is that? And Helen responds, whom your discerning eyes have singled out is Ithacus the wise, a barren island boasts his glorious birth. His fame for wisdom fills the spacious earth. Antenor took the word and thus began. Myself, O king, have seen that wondrous man when, trusting Jove and hospitable laws, to Troy he came to plead the Grecian cause. Great Menelaus urged the same request. My house was honored with each royal guest. I knew their persons and admired their parts, both brave in arms and both approved in arts. Erect, the Spartan most engaged our view, Ulysses seated, greater reverence drew when Atreus's son harangued the listening train. Just was his sense and his expression plain, his words succinct yet full without a fault. He spoke no more than just the thing he ought. Notice the, the comments on rhetoric. His words were succinct Yet full, without a fault, he spoke no more than just the thing he ought. That's the mark of a good speech. To say no more or no less than is necessary, but exactly what needs to be said. Good judgment in speaking. But when Ulysses rose in thought profound, his modest eyes he fixed upon the ground. As one unskilled or dumb, he seemed to stand, nor raised his head, nor stretched his sceptered hand. But when he speaks, what elocution flows, soft as the fleeces of descending snows. The copious accents fall with easy art, melting they fall and sink into the heart. Wondering, we hear, and fixed in deep surprise, our ears refute the censure of our eyes. 
he speaks of the of the wisdom and eloquence of Ulysses, Odysseus. The king then asked, as yet the camp he viewed, What chief is that, with giant strength endued, whose brawny shoulders and whose swelling chest and lofty stature far exceed the rest? Ajax the Great, the beauteous queen, replied, Himself a host, himself an army, the Grecian strength and pride. See, bold Idomeneus, superior towers, amid yon circle of his Cretan powers, great as a god. I saw him once before with Menelaus on the Spartan shore. The rest I know, and could in order name all valiant chiefs and mighty men of fame. Yet two are wanting of the numerous train, whom long my eyes have sought, but sought in vain. Castor and Pollux, first in martial force, one bold on foot, and one renowned for horse. My brothers these, the same our native shore, one house contained us as one mother bore. Perhaps the chiefs from warlike toils at ease for distant Troy refused to sail the seas. Perhaps their sword some nobler quarrel draws, ashamed to combat in their sister's cause. So spoke the fair, nor knew her brother's doom. Wrapped in the cold embraces of the tomb, adorned with honors in their native shore, silent they slept and heard of wars no more. Meantime, the heralds through the crowded town bring the rich wine and the destined victims or sacrifices down. Idaeus's arms, the golden goblets pressed, who thus the venerable king addressed. Arise, O father of the Trojan state, the nations call, thy joyful people wait, to seal this truce and end this dire debate. Paris, thy son, and Sparta's king advance, in measured lists to toss the weighty lance. And who his rival shall in arms subdue, his be the dame, and his the treasure too. Thus with a lasting league our toils may cease, and Troy possess her fertile fields in peace. So shall the Greeks review, return and view, their native shore, much famed for generous steeds, for beauty more. Just a quick note, you'll see sometimes that phrases are repeated, like that phrase there, and Troy possess her fertile fields in peace, so shall the Greeks review their native shore, much famed for generous steeds, for beauty more. We've already seen that same set of lines in a previous passage. This in in this epic poetry is called a formula, and these poems uh, would have been recited by memory or from memory by Homer. And the, the idea is that these, these memorized lines served as sort of a filler that allowed the poet to, um, to continue the song going without having to think of more lines by repeating certain pleasant lines, almost like we would repeat a chorus in a song. So you'll see that at times you'll see repeated lines and need to remember that this is a poem being recited or performed by the poet, which is what Homer would have originally done. With grief, going back to Priam, with grief he heard and bade the chiefs prepare to join his milk-white courses to the car. 
he, he mounts the seat, and Tenor at his side, the gentle steeds through Skaya's gates they guide. Next, from the car descending on the plain, amid the Grecian host and Trojan train, slow they proceed. The sage Ulysses then arose, and with him rose the king of men. On either side a sacred herald stands, the wine they mix, and on each monarch's hands pour the full urn, then draws the Grecian lord, his cutlass sheathed beside his ponderous sword. From these signed victims crops the curling hair, the heralds part it and the princes share. Then loudly thus before the attentive bands he calls the gods and spreads his lifted hands. O first and greatest power whom all obey, who high on Ida's holy mountain sway, eternal Jove, and you, bright orb, sun, bright orb, that roll from east to west and view from pole to pole, thou, mother earth, and all ye living floods, infernal furies and Tartarian gods, gods of the underworld, who rule the dead, and horrid woes prepare for perjured kings and all who falsely swear. We see that treachery um, and fraud are considered the greatest of crimes. <clears throat> Hear and be witness, if by Paris slain, great Menelaos press the fatal plain, the dame and treasures let the Trojan keep, and Greece, returning, plow the watery deep. If by my brother's lance the Trojan bleed, be his the wealth and the beauteous dame indeed or decreed. The appointed fine let Ilion, Troy, justly pay and every age record this signal day. Thus if, this if the Phrygians shall refuse to yield, arms must revenge and Mars decide the field. So the agreement is made, proposed by Agamemnon, that Paris and Menelaus will fight. That will be the end of the fighting, and as long as everyone keeps their word, um, the two nations, the Greeks and the Trojans, can go on in peace. With that, the chief, the tender victims, slew. The sacrifices were offered. And in the dust their bleeding bodies threw. The vital spirit issued at the wound and left the members quivering on the ground. From these same urn they drink the mingled wine and add libations, which are drink offerings. They would simply pour out their drinks on the ground as a sacrifice to the gods. These are called libations. <clears throat> and add libations to the powers divine. While thus their prayers united mount the sky, hear, mighty Jove, and hear ye gods on high, and may their blood, who first the league confound, shed like this wine, disdain the thirsty ground. May all their consorts serve promiscuous lust, and all their lust be scattered as the dust. Thus either host their imprecations or prayers joined, which Jove refused and mingled with the wind. The rites now finished, reverend Priam rose 
and thus expressed a heart or charged with woes. Priam speaks. Ye Greeks and Trojans, let the chiefs engage, but spare the weakness of my feeble age. In yonder walls that object let me shun, nor view the danger of so dear a son whose arms shall conquer, and what prince shall fall, heaven only knows, for heaven disposes all. That's the second reference we've seen from Priam, sort of referring all things to this providence or, or fate directed by the gods. This said, the hoary or white-haired king no longer stayed, but on his car or chariot the slaughter victims laid, then seized the reins, his gentle steeds to guide, and drove to Troy, Antenor at his side. Bold Hector, the Trojan, and Ulysses, the Greek, now dispose the lists of combat and the ground enclose, next to decide by sacred lots prepare, who first shall launch his pointed spear in air. So this is like a duel, but instead of guns, they use javelins, you know, pointed spears, and they're going to throw them at one another. The people pray with elevated hands, and words like these are heard through all the bands. Immortal Jove, these are the prayers being offered. Immortal Jove, high heaven's superior lord, on lofty Ida's holy mount adored, who e'er involved us in this dire debate, oh, give that author of the war to fate, and shades eternal, let division cease, and joyful nations join in leagues of peace. So the soldiers are praying, that this will be an end to this bloody war. With eyes averted, Hector hastes to turn the lots of fight and shakes the brazen urn. Then Paris, thine leaped force forth by fatal chance, ordained the first to whirl the weighty lance. To settle things by lot, basically means to, you know, roll the dice or draw straws, if you, if you want some modern examples to compare it to. It means that in order to choose who, who goes first, it's like uh, playing paper, rock, scissors, or, you know, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. By drawing lots, it's a way to sort of let the gods decide who goes first. So Paris leaped forth by fatal chance, ordained the first to whirl the weighty lance. Both armies sat the combat to survey. Beside each chief his azure armor lay. And round the lists the generous coursers neigh, the horses, the horses are making noises, they're restless. The beauteous warrior now arrays for fight in gilded, in shining or golden arms, magnificently bright. The purple cushions clasp his thighs around with flowers adorned, with silver buckles bound. Lucaon's corslet, his fair body dressed, braced in and fitted to his softer breast. A radiant baldric o'er his shoulder tied, sustained the sword that glittered at his side. His youthful face a polished helm or spread a helmet. The waving horsehair nodded on his head. His figured shield, a shining orb he takes, and in his hand a pointed javelin shakes. With equal speed and fired by equal charms, the Spartan hero sheathes his limbs in arms. Now round the lists the admiring armies stand, with javelins fixed the Greek and Trojan band. 
Amidst the dreadful vale, or valley, the chiefs advance, all pale with rage, and shake the threatening lance. The Trojan first, his shining javelin threw, so Paris gets to throw first. Full on Atrides' ringing shield it flew, nor pierced that brazen orb, but with a bound leaped from the buckler blunted on the ground. In other words, Paris's throw struck Menelaus square in the shield and had no harmful effect and merely fell to the ground. So now it's Menelaus' turn to throw at Paris. Atrides, Menelaus, the son of Atreus. Atrides then his massy lance prepares in act to throw, but first prefers his prayers. Give me, great Jove, to punish lawless lust and lay this Trojan gasping in the dust. Destroy the aggressor Aid my righteous cause, avenge this breach of hospitable laws. Let this example future times reclaim, and guard from wrong fair friendship's holy name. So Menelaus offers quite a prayer, asking for Jupiter to help him to avenge his loss and promote virtue in the future. He said, and poised in air, the javelin sent through Paris's shield, the forceful weapon went. His corslet pierces and his garment rends, and glancing downward near his flank descends. So he strikes Paris into his armor. The weary Trojan, bending from the blow, eludes the death and disappoints his foe. So the, so the injury to Paris is not fatal. But fierce Atrides waved his sword and struck full on his casque. The crested helmet shook. The brittle steel, unfaithful to his hand, broke short. The fragments glittered on the sand. The raging warrior to the spacious skies raised his upbraiding voice and angry eyes. Then is it vain in Jove himself to trust? And is it thus the gods assist the just? So Menelaus is complaining because of his failed attack. When crimes provoke us, heaven's success denies. The dart falls harmless and the falchion flies. Furious, he said, and towards the Grecian crew, seized by the crest, the unhappy warrior drew. Struggling, he followed while the embroidered thong that tied his helmet dragged the chief along. Then had his ruin crowned, then had his ruin crowned Atrides' joy, but Venus trembled for the prince of Troy. Venus, the god of love, favors Paris. Unseen she came and burst the golden band, and left an empty helmet in his hand. The cask enraged, amidst the Greeks he threw. The Greeks with smiles the polished trophy view. Then, as once more he lifts the deadly dart, in thirst of vengeance at his rival's heart, the queen of love her favored champion shrouds, for gods can all things in a veil of clouds. Raised from the field, the panting youth she led, 
and gently laid him on the bridal bed. So Venus rescues Paris from this battle and takes him away. With pleasing sweets, his fainting sense renews, and all the dome, his head, perfumes with heavenly dews, with perfumes. Meantime, the brightest of the female kind, the matchless Helen, o'er the walls reclined. To her, beset with Trojan beauties, came in borrowed form the laughter-loving dame. She seemed an ancient maid, well-skilled to cull the snowy fleece and wind the twi and wind the twisted wool. The goddess softly shook her silken vest that shed perfumes and whispering thus addressed. So this is Venus, the goddess of love, speaking to Helen. Haste, happy nymph, for thee thy Paris calls, safe from the fight in yonder lofty walls. Fair as a god, with odors round him spread, he lies and waits thee on the well-known bed. Not like a warrior parted from the foe, but some gay dancer, happy dancer. Don't think it's, refer it's not referring to anything homosexual. It's some gay or, or happy dancer in a public show. So Venus tells Helen that she should return to the palace because Paris has actually been brought there and is, and, and is waiting for her. She spoke, Venus spoke, and Helen's secret soul was moved. She scorned the champion, but the man she loved. Fair Venus's neck, her eyes that sparkled fire and breast, revealed the queen of soft desire. Struck with her presence, straight the lively red, forsook her cheek and trembling, thus she said. Then is it still thy pleasure to deceive, and woman's frailty always to believe? Say, to new nations must I cross the, the main, or carry wars to some soft Asian plain? For who must Helen break her second vow? What other Paris is thy darling now? Left to Atrides, victor in the strife, an odious conquest and a captive wife. Hence let me sail, and if thy Paris bear my absence ill, let Venus ease his care a handmaid goddess at his side to wait, renounce the glories of thy heavenly state, be fixed forever to the Trojan shore, his spouse or slave, and mount the skies no more. For me, to, lo to lawless love no longer led, I scorn the coward and detest his bed. Else should I merit everlasting shame and keen reproach from every Phrygian dame. Ill suits it now the joys of love to know, to deep, too deep my anguish, and too wild my woe. Then, thus incensed, the Paphian queen replies, Obey the power from whom thy glories rise. Should Venus leave thee, every charm must fly, fade from thy cheek and languish in thy eye. Cease to provoke me, lest I make thee more the world's aversion than their love before. Now the bright prize for which mankind engage than the sad victim of the public rage. At this, the fairest of her sex obeyed and veiled her blushes in a silken shade, unseen and silent from the train she moves, led by the goddess of the smiles and loves. Arrived and entered at the palace gate, 
The maids officious round their mistress wait, then all dispersing various tasks attend. The queen and goddess to the prince ascend. Full in her Paris's sight, the queen of love had placed the beauteous progeny of Jove. Whereas he viewed her charms, she turned away her glowing eyes and thus began to say, Is this the chief who, lost to sense of shame, Late fled the field, and yet survives his fame? O oh, hadst thou died beneath the righteous sword Of that brave man whom once I called my lord? The boaster Paris oft desired the day With Sparta's king to meet in single fray. Go now, once more thy rival's rage excite, Provoke Atrides, and renew this fight. Yet Helen bids thee stay, lest thou, unskilled, Shouldst fall an easy conquest on the field. The prince replies, Ah, cease, divinely fair, Nor add reproach reproaches to the wounds I bear. This day the foe prevailed by Pallas's power, we yet may vanquish in a happier hour. There want not gods to favor us above, but let the business of our life be love. Those softer moments let delights employ, and kind embraces snatch the hasty joy. Not thus I loved thee when from Sparta's shore my forced, my willing, heavenly prize I bore, when first entranced in Cranai's isle I lay, mixed with thy soul and all dissolved away. Thus having spoke, the enamored Phrygian boy that is Paris rushed to the bed impatient for the joy. Him Helen followed, slow with bashful charms, and clasped the blooming hero in her arms. So while all of this trouble's going on, these armies are faced each other, are facing each other for battle. And Paris was supposed to fight against Menelaus. Paris is now in his bed alone with Helen um, after Venus carries him out of the battle scene. While these to love's delicious rapture yield, the stern Atrides rages round the field. Menelaus is angry. So some fell lion whom the woods obey roars through the desert and demands his prey. Paris he seeks impatient to destroy, but seeks in vain along the troops of Troy. Even those had yielded to a foe so brave, the recreant warrior, hateful as the grave. Then speaking thus, the king of kings arose. Ye Trojans, Dardans, all our generous foes, here and attest, from heaven with conquest crowned, our brother's arms the just success have found. Be therefore now the Spartan wealth restored, let Argive Helen on her lawful own her lawful lord. The appointed fine let Ilion justly pay, and age to age record this signal day. So the Greeks claim victory, and they want their reward, and they want this war to come to an end. He ceased. His army's loud applauses rise, and the long shout runs echoing through the skies. And this is the end of book three. So in book three of the Iliad, we read of the one-on-one -on -one combat between Paris and Menelaus. Paris tries to escape. He's forced to return by Hector. Um, he goes ahead and fights against Menelaus. They each take a turn throwing spears Paris's spear strikes Menelaus's shield and does no harm, and then Menelaus 
strikes Paris. Uh, Venus, however, carries Paris away, brings him safely back to his bedroom, and there he and Helen uh, are together. Um, in spite of all this trouble, Menelaus proclaims his victory, demands his, his prize, and as Book 3 closes, it appears that the Trojan War has ended and the problem has been solved. So that's all for book three. Um, you should study this book on your own. There's a lot of detail in there that you're going to have to review. And if you have any questions about what anything means or need anything explained, just contact me for help. I'm happy to answer any questions you have, but I hope that's a good and helpful introduction and walk through book three of Homer's Iliad. God bless your studies.